The road that leads to a legend. Today, you're gonna hear a story that faceted Brazil when it comes to one specific gem. And that gemstone is aquamarine. What a beautiful day to talk about aquamarine. And if you don't know me, I'm Tanner Denise. And I'm here to share a story about a legendary gemstone, which everything in this story is a must. If you love gemstone, if you love minerals, you gotta know this story. The story today is about an aquamarine, not just any aquamarine, an aquamarine that facets the, what Brazil is known in terms of high quality and high end gemstones globally. Brazil is the number one producer of this beautiful gemstone from the barrel family called Aquamarine, which is the same family of emeralds, goshenite, bixbite, pezzotite, uh, yellow barrel, heliodor, and many others, right? But for me, there are only one king when it comes to barrel, and that king is Aquamarine, Brazil being the number one producer, followed by Madagascar, India, Pakistan, Nigeria, and Mozambique. These are the big players when it comes to aquamarine. But if you're the biggest producer, it's expected for you to produce some of the most magnificent specimens in the world. And in this case, it wasn't different. Let's into this story. In 1980, in a city called Pedra Azul in Minas Gerais, there was a mine there, pretty known, okay, but not super famous, not like a Santa Maria mine. Was known for a good quality aquamarine, sometimes pieces of 20 carats, 30 carats. Was not uncommon to find out of this specific production in Brazil. But imagine this, this is where the story starts. Imagine you're a miner, okay, and in Brazil called Garimpeiros, is the miners that they go in, they literally hand mine for this material in the pegmatite tunnel, which sometimes can go yards or feet and feet and feet down the tunnel. Uh, not only long, but you can go deep, deep. We're talking easily, easily 200 feet down the earth, in all by hand chisel, hand chisel, right? So imagine one more day going to work, all the guys, the group talking in the morning, and when they start chiseling, they start chiseling, they start chiseling. The pegmata, which is a very hard rock, one of the guys just said, stop everything. Stop, stop, stop everything. Cut the machines, it's too loud. Call the owner, because I think we hit something here that I never seen in my life. And they start slowly, slowly chiseling, chiseling, chiseling those gemstones in the rock, in cleaning, in cleaning. They came across an aquamarine in meters, you're looking about one meter, 91 centimeter, which I would say was 30, 30 inches in height. Now, it made it 10 inches on the specimen itself, on the thickness of the crystal. And that material, because it was one of a kind, and the world have never seen an aquamarine. Please understand, we're not talking about the size of the aquamarine. It's a whole group of, of the specifics of this mineral that made this the number one aquamarine ever produced. Because it had the size, it had the color, and most important, it had the clarity. So guys, normally you gotta choose. You can go Santa Maria, beautiful color, but not big sizes. Or you can go, for example, uh, Santa Teresa, right? We love Santa Teresa. It's a beautiful light color aquamarine. You can find 500 carats, you can find 300 carat pieces, but not saturated in color. So imagine this, for the very first time in the history of mankind, there was an aquamarine that could rival Santa Maria in color, that was more crystallized than Santa Teresa, and 
Guys, I don't know how to put this in measurement for you guys. An aquamarine in general, it produces from this size, a good specimen this size, let's say I hit the jackpot, the size of my hand. This piece was about this size in this thick. For a piece like this, understand that the process of taking out a piece like this is very slow, right? But I understand the guys. It's like, oh my God, we hit the jackpot. We're gonna go everybody buy a house. Everybody's gonna buy a car. The excitement there. It breaks my heart to say this, but on the process of extracting the piece, they broke the aquamarine in three pieces which in one side, even though it's sad, but if you kind of look, it was good. That gave the opportunity for people like us to own pieces from that specific piece, which, let's put it this way. Piece number three, which was the, the bottom of the tail of the aqua, was the most included, but produced clean material that was cut in oval, trillion, pear cuts, and they were sold all over the globe. Number two, or piece B, was slightly better in clarity, but the color uniform through the piece, okay? It was then cut into some larger pieces from uh, compared to the part C of the parcel. And those pieces, they mainly ended up in the Italian market and the uh, Japanese market, also in the American and German market. The question is, what do we do with the king or the queen of the collection, right? That piece, there were not a hundred buyers for a piece like that. I gotta be honest with you. It's like when you're talking about a piece that is, let's say, half a million dollar par, so a million dollar par, so even back in the 80s, I could name for you easily 50 companies that could hand on the pocket and buy that piece. So imagine that a legendary aquamarine like that, we're talking the best, the biggest, the most expensive aquamarine ever produced, you gotta have a specific buyer. In my opinion, I think the guys, they rush too much in selling because from what I heard, okay, please understand that aquamarine was produced three years before I was born. So imagine this. There was a guy, a buyer from Teófilo Tony, Minas Gerais, which is very close to my hometown in Brazil, that he was at the mine when they produced that piece. He made a uh, couple phone calls here and there. He raised some money, first buyer. And then he went to Teófilo Tony, second buyer. And then eventually it ended up in the hand of a tycoon when it comes to Aquamarina in Brazil. Uh, which is your Agenor Tavares. Agenor Tavares, he was the patriarch of this uh, Tavares family, which I did not have the pleasure to meet him, but I do have the pleasure to say that uh, his son, his nephew, that today are the guys in the business. They are very good friends of mine, especially Emerson uh, Tavares, if you're watching. Hello for you, uh, Oswaldo Tavares, if you're watching. These are my brothers from different mother, right? And up to today, uh, due to that, I would say they were known for aquamarine, but not as known as they became once they purchased this specific aquamarine that was named, understand, not many gemstones, colored gemstones receive a name. Uh, that's mainly known for diamonds, like you have the Jubilee, and you have the, the other diamonds that are well known and they had names that you can search on the web for a specific name. In a color gemstone to receive a name that is worldwide recognized, a worldwide spoken, that's as rare as an aquamarine like that. So the name was given Dom, Pe Dom Pedro, if you don't know, the second was the last emperor uh, for Portugal to reign in Brazil. So it was named after him. And eventually, Ageno Tavares, with his contacts that he had, understand, one of the biggest gem dealers uh, that ever existed in Brazil, he had some of the biggest customers in the world on his pocket. And he made one phone call because, understand, 
And a piece like that is a one of a kind. So you gotta make one phone call. You can't waste time and call it three, four, maybe guys. He knew exactly who was the gentleman. That gentleman was, and he was sitting in Ida Oberstein in, in Germany. If you don't know Ida Oberstein, I had the pleasure to live there for a year of my life. And let me tell you a little bit about there. Ida Oberstein is the birthplace of the modern way to cut gemstones. There, you go there, there's companies there, they have signs saying, a company opened since 1782. So imagine, we're talking tradition and tradition and tradition of the best cutters on the planet. Mr. Geno sold the piece for the best cutter of the capital of cutting gemstone in the world for high-end pieces. This gentleman, he took nearly one year to cut this gem. Four months only studying the gem um, with pen and pencil and marking and see what to do with that piece. And an extra six months after that to actually finish cutting and carving the piece. Look at this. I said cutting and carving the piece. This gentleman, this master gem cutter, okay, uh, let's say, let's put it this way. You like Star Wars? I love Star Wars. Imagine that he is Master Yoda, okay, for cutting gemstones. As he said, and this became very famous, he said, if I trace the money, I lose the beauty. So what is more important? Let's chase the money or let's chase the beauty? I'll tell you this, if he had chased the money, maybe this wouldn't become what it is today in the world of gemstones. It wouldn't be sitting in the Smithsonian today and public uh, exposition as one of the key pieces in the mineral department in the Smithsonian in the US. It is a piece that has been in France, has been in Italy in exposition, has been in Brazil. Uh, the piece, by the way, if you guys want to know a little bit more who bought the piece, was a couple uh, from the United States. They own a company that uh, used to supply medical equipment and they decided to buy and donate the piece to the museum. Look how great is that, right? So that piece, back in the day, let's calculate. Do you think half a million dollars is a lot of money? Would you say a million dollars is a lot of money? So imagine a million dollars back in 1980, when a million dollar was a million dollar. Now you're gonna multiply by two. Is that a lot of money, two million dollars? I'll say two million dollars will change anybody's life they never saw that kind of money in their life. But today, imagine back in 1980. Now, imagine that multiplied by two. That piece is the record breaker up to today. Even today, there's not a single aquamarine that was sold in a single piece for over $4 million. And that number it stands as a record since 1980. And I don't think any aquamarine in the world is gonna break that. So that being said, I urge you to have a look at some pictures here. I want to say Fifi, uh, hello, Fifi is a dear friend of mine. He gave me a lot of uh, behind the scene information about this. I want to say thank you to my brother Tanit, which he made a diligence uh, with Ageno, with Ageno um, uh, nephew and sons to gather the real information about this. I know you can find little videos here and there. I wanted to make a more comprehensive video talking about the mining, talking about the city, talking about the size, and most important, it wasn't just the size. I found an aquamarine that actually was three times the weight of that piece in a single piece in Kumaru do Norte, but by no means that aquamarine would ever yield me a piece that was a quarter of the size of the Dom Pedro aquamarine in terms of clean material. So Dom Pedro is the number one because it had the size, the clarity, and the color. And by the way, Dom Pedro is the name of the rough after our super Yoda master gem cutter from Ida Oberstein, he finished cutting. He renamed the, uh, the final piece as Ondas Maritimas, uh, is a Portuguese name. That's how you're gonna find an exposition in the Smithsonian. I highly recommend you go there. 
There are a few pieces that my family personally donated to the Smithsonian. So if you have the chance there, look for Denise uh, donation pieces and stay tuned for the next. But before we leave, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe so we can keep doing amazing stories like that. Thank you very much. See you the next time.